Greetings! It's I, Countess Nara van Dekoven, your Lord and Emperor, here at the Chicoven Empire, and welcome. You've been joining me, well, I talk about a lot of tabletop, both on live, on stream, up on Twitch, and then it comes up to YouTube if you're more likely watching it on YouTube a little later on. But either way, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Uh, if you're joining me live, you've probably been here for a little bit as I've been chatting, but hey, uh, I will talk about some of the issues that we're having today. So, there's a little bit of technical issues, but I did manage to get this this stuff together before the technical issues finally uh, hit us. It's just the thing that um, one of the images today will be from the Archives of Nethys, which is the only site that I could find for the image of it. But Archives of Nethys is messed up right now. I had prepared pages in the archives and for research and stuff like that previously. So we can still do today. But that's just a little preface there. So what I do for these, this is the Starfinder Species Guide, if you haven't realized that. It's the final episode. We're going from V, where we have our wonderful and uh, interesting bar Kula, all the way to the end, where we'll be ending with the uh, Zulgoth. So we got 11 more species to talk about, finish up today, and then we would have gone through, as of this moment, all these species that have been defined in Starfinder to play. With the Starfinder 2nd Edition coming out, with any more, more books and stuff, there might be more that I've missed in talking about it. But I'm giving you a basic rundown of society, some information about them, a little, only a little bit about their stats. Uh, basically, this is the, you know, role-playing side of playing these species, if you haven't noticed from the things right now. The mechanical side, honestly, when it's working, going to archives and this. Or I will talk about which books to look up here uh, for these different ones, too. So that will also be a source uh, for the actual books. But, you know, um, if you've played any of these in a Starfinder game, let me know. Or what are your thoughts about some of them? Which ones would you think would be the most interesting? That's going to be the comments, either if you're joining me live over on the uh, Twitch side of things, or if you're joining YouTube, just put in the comments. And remember, give some support on those places. Uh, Follow on Twitch at the very least, the subscription, liking, ringing the bell, all that kind of stuff over on YouTube. That means the world to me, uh, you know, helps out, makes more of this kind of stuff. Just some basic support is all I want to Let's talk about species. Because there are still a number of species that we haven't talked about. And, you know, I, I as usual, I do talk about what books to look in. I mentioned a little bit about them, but we'll start with uh, this one. We can use this image here. We'll use the other image, the larger size image. But this is the tiny image of the one that I accidentally broke the page of uh, when I was trying to figure out what was going on with Archives of Nethys. And so, hey, uh, hopefully that page will be back up soon. Let me check it out. As of when I'm doing this live, it's not. But this is the Varkolica. Uh, they're also known as soul lights. Um, they are undead that occur when a humanoid dies with intense desire to continue living. Um, it's a, basically a strong will that the soul doesn't pass into the river of souls for Phrasma's judgment. Basically, the moral essence passes away a portion of it, leaving a soul with little memory of who he once was, locked inside a half-living body. Um, it's a reminder of grim determination and rage. Um, it's basically the curse of Varkul. It's also known as with many occult scholars. Um, hope, so, supposedly the first one was a human named Varkul. That exist, it, it basically existed thousands of years before the Gap, and still does. Um, and the Varkul make a deal with him uh, to continue living that they don't remember. That's kind of like legends of the entire thing. They look a lot like they did in life, with the uh, except that the limbs and sensory organs uh, that are outside the human norm wither away or turn to dust. Uh, the shuntas uh, lose their antennas, where kashas lose extra arms and strix lose their wings. Uh, basically, it's assumed that this might be related to. Of course, humanity and Varkul, who was human, and because these people are his offsprings or something, they make sacrifices. Eyes undergrow changes. Um, they're orbs that give away cold light. Could be of any hue. Um, a Varkul that has eaten or recently rested can look almost alive and becomes pale and drawn quickly between periods of refreshments. Uh, 
Uh, and they never look so much like corpses as when they sleep. Uh, and these little changes are what prevent them from passing as normal members of their humanoid species, or any humanoid species. They're creatures of deep passion. Um, they sense life is uh, fleeting, and that they have experienced what life has to offer. Um, so they're rarely idle. They can be obsessive, having died once, um, and averse to risks because of that. They sometimes will see the whatever they had unfinished in their previous life as their purpose for their existence. Um, they do sometimes reintegrate with society that uh, death basically separated them from temporarily. Some do, unfortunately, only remember the circumstances of their death. Uh, that one recollection can lead to basically a focus on vengeance, seeking those responsible. Um... They can also become obsessed with the chain of blame. Once they take out the one, it's like continuing along. Like, ah, you're at fault, but that person caused you to be at fault, you know. And so that can be, you know, tenuous connections there. You know, if a mercenary killed you, you first kill that mercenary and then their entire company. Uh, and those that hired the mercenary and eventually those responsible for conflict, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that can be a path of destruction that leads them to a second and final death. Yeah. Like I said, Alien Archive 3 is the book to check out here. It's the book that I'm getting information from. Uh, give bonuses to Khan and Chris on penalty to wisdom. Um, they're small or medium undead, depending on the species they belong to. Um, they have a constitution, lack the unliving trait, and don't gain undead immunities. So, type-wise, they are undead, but there's some unique factors about them because they are technically half-alive, um, so the Dark Nation, Death Vitality, Death Weakness, Grave Touch, uh, Silver Susceptibility, Topor, and Unliving Visage, all of which are discarded. Information Alien Archives are up on Archives, and this one's finally working, but that is the, uh, Varkulak. Interesting group. Alright, uh, Let's continue onward, because we do have more to talk about with, and we have here the Varatana from the uh, Perfect Storm, um, which is a Adventure Path book, Starfinder number 46. Let me look that up. The Perfect Storm Starfinder. Uh, from Drift, Crafter, Drift Crashers number one. Archives down, I can't link to these books quickly, so it takes me a minute. <laughs> um, they're the primary sentient species in the vast world of Varentian, uh, known for winds that sweep uh, from high rocky bluffs uh, across its wide stormy seas. The winds are a mystery to the off-world sciences, as they seem to blow in unpredictable ways, sometimes shifting from moment to moment as the subject of their own personal whims. And the... Uh, and, and the some unknown force controlling it. Uh, the Varatana cherish this uniqueness. They don't track wind directions, uh, but the chaotic planar energies that crackle, uh, but by the chaotic planar energies that crackle within them. Many believe the dynamic nature of the winds holds the memories of the goddess they call the Great Shipwright, who they say visited uh, Varantina long before the gap and crafted the finest sails in the world's essence. Uh, whether this deity is an aspect of a known divine power, a unique god, or something else entirely is a mystery. There are bipedal humanoids with long legs and opposable uh, toes, narrow arms with fins on their elbows, short torsos, pointed ears. Um, their physical form reflects the energies of their home, uh, worlds and winds. Uh, they named the aspect of their trimorphism after the three winds of the world. Um, Hardy, blustery, Vartana have broad shoulders and triceratop-like crests. Uh, nimble, carry-wing Vartana have long, silky feathers growing from their heads in place of hair. And salient, fracture-wing Vartanas have shorter limbs and flattened skulls with ridges like that of a Parasolapsus. So basically, they have basically three basic forms. Uh, no matter the birth, uh, their lives are a loose collective uh, 
are as loose collective workers and engineers, and have long since automated their agriculture so that they can better develop their attempts to perfect their chaos sails, which they outfit their starships. Uh, their family units are on average monogamous, though the jobs of raging and educating young are often shared with a specific community. Most learn focuses on technical engineering, but a, uh, but such as maintaining their agriculture's automation, innovating starship designs. However, artistic endeavors are highly encouraged by educators across the planet. So it's sort of like, you know, the basic engineering is technical engineering, but if you're an artist, you're encouraged to be an artist, because there can be found beauty in that uh, engineering. Uh, the big thing is they get bonus decks, uh, they get Terraserves, and Trimorphic. Um, basically, the Trimorphic is, depending on what type you get, you get a feat. Either Great Fortitude, Lightning Reflexes, or Iron Worm. Other than that, they just physically look kind of weird. That's it. Huh. Alright. Let's talk about the uh, Verthanian. These are from the original Alien Archive. If you want to check out the book, the book up them up into. Uh, they're the primary hammocks of Verses, and are uh, some of the earliest humanoids in the pack world to build space-bearing vessels. In uh, uh, response to the struggle to survive in the harsh climates of their tidally locked planet. They stand about eight feet tall, delicate features and long limbs. Their eyes are pure black orb or orbs protruding from their heads in half domes like the eyes of a mouse. Uh, they can change the pigment of their skin at will to complex patterns. Nearly all of Verthani learn to control these color changes by the time they reach puberty, but babies and children uh, display bright, expressive patterns and colors that reflect their current mood. Uh, some adults also refuse to control them, seeing in, uh, seeing in the random patterns hints of prophecy. Uh, the society was split into three castes, the augmented, the pure ones, and god vessels. Their cast is chosen during adolescence, uh, though few Verduni today bind themselves to such strict system rules. Traditions still carry a measure of cultural pride, and some Verduni proud wear the, proudly they wear their labels. So, it's sort of like a thing is, they, their, their caste system has broken down, but there's still plenty of them that are proud in the place in the caste system they came from, but, you know, most people just don't. Um, the augmented were those that modified the body of technology using cybernetic augmentations. It was popular with those that piloted early Aether ships, uh, the, basically their first vessels that went through the stars. And augmented Verthani pirates are still renowned for some of the most skilled pilots in the pack worlds. Pure ones excuse technology augmentation responsible for supporting the other costs, farming and government. Modern pure ones have accepted at least some modest cybernetics and biotech improvements in their bodies. These are proud of their uh, roles as traditional caretakers. So it's sort of like the idea of cybernetics and body enhancements aren't gotten rid of it completely anymore. It's just they kind of look like they're real. And uh, god vessels uh, serve faithfully as living avatars of their deities, displaying the status by branding holy symbols called devotionals into their chests, usually using acid or flames. Uh, they never cover up these distinct marks, despite the fact that scar tissues around them never fully healed and, cannot, can no, and they can no longer change color. Um, their culture is the model of independent democratic cooperation. Uh, they're forced to live on a cramped sliver of their planet, surrounded by nearly inhospitable lands on either side. They learn how to work together uh, without violence or subjugation, and choose the hardest technology to increase resources rather than battle each other over scraps. Uh, Versi's Ring of Nations uh, remain a shining example of a one-world government in which citizens remain protected yet free to go about their own way. In many ways, the pack world system itself is directly inspired by these aspects of their culture. Forced to con eight penalty strength. Uh, they're medium humanoids, easily augmented, low light vision, skill focus, and skin. Move on to these people that look like sea anemones. They're the uh, Vild Era. Vilraru. You're welcome. I try. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, they were introduced in, of course, uh, Escape from the Prison Moon, which was the eighth Starfinder adventure path, which is in the Against the Iron Throne uh, adventure path, Starfinder adventure path series. They're natives of o uh, Yoji, a vast and hot ocean world with few landmasses. 
Uh, the Vildararos evolved in the sea, but developed their civilization on land. Creating complex maps of the night sky, they used them to navigate and settle the entire world, building uh, geometrically precise cities that mimic the shapes of stars and constellations. Their culture centers on geometric constructions and ornamentation. Their bodies, settlements, and structures bear ultimate representations of ancestors, spirits, nature deities, other mythical themes. Uh, the Islanti recently conquered their planet, meeting little resistances, and having come to appreciate their skill in architecture, geometry, and navigation. After cribbing numerous uh, ones for ex expeditionary ships, putting them to work as star cartographers in a new series of worlds, uh, they elevated the species to citizens. Um, so they are one of these species that has been elevated to citizens because of their contributions to the Islanti Star Empire. Um, they're slowly uh, coming to terms with Star Empire's restrictions on their rights to worship their own gods and carry their cultural artifacts beyond their homeworlds, but it seems the Islanti monoculture is uh, a weight the Verderos might not be able to bear for long. And it seems like their this monoculture can't bear for long. Um, although lying flat on the ground is their most natural state, in mixed company they remain upright, standing on three legs. They're also capable of walking this way. Uh, a down, downward pointing beak works as a mouth for intake and substance and communications. Fine tentacles that fold into a central crown can be used for tactile manipulation. They have no male sex, instead start life as females and develop the ability to produce fertilizing gametes as they age. The eggs of a ver uh, verdel rumo produce, uh, producers can develop asexually in females, sexually when fertilized by an older adult, or via self-fertilization when they reach maturity. Um, so yes. They are ju uh, juveniles are born uh, physically capable of relying on a birthing parent for care. Their parent or parents pass on genetic knowledge, allowing the young to accelerate learning and the ability to function much like adolescents of other species within several months to a year. Uh, desire for variety in this hereditary education has encouraged the Varelo culture to favor sexual reproduction. So basically, so they don't need to sexually reproduce because they want variety in their culture and you producing, you're getting information genetically from both of your parents, it does come across in interesting things. When they speak common or other gender languages, they refer to themselves in feminine terms. They recognize that that is their one technical sex in accordance to other species. Uh, advanced technology is still new to them, but they've adapted well to it, especially with computers and navigational tools that allow them to extend their vision beyond what they can see. Uh, they have realized they are capable of comprehending and remembering vast volumes of spatial data, consequently. These cap capabilities make them excellent navigators, talented pilots, as well as... Uh, skilled in many sort of designs. They're about six feet tall and weigh 150 pounds if you start an adult at five and live about 100 years. Bonus to intelligence, they're amphibious, spatial awareness, swimmer, unflying. Um, interesting one there. The, uh, they're uh, really neat little, 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 little gals there. Space wolves. Uh, the Valaka. They're from Interspeller Species uh, book. So that... The, when I mention Iller Snow species, prepare for a big one. So their homeworld is dying. It's a frigid planet of uh, Lacos orbits a fading sun, growing colder and colder each year. Uh, eventually, their even thick, like, uh, thick fur won't be able to protect against the chill. They stand together. On a harsh world like their own, the population has a different way of uh, physical experience, experiencing the world around it. It takes community to survive, and they, uh, the Lacos... Uh, view that many circles of trust, from family, social circles, crewmates, as a source of strength and survival. I'll give their stats now, because they usually give it first here in the information. Uh, bonus to wits, charisma, penalty to uh, intelligence. Uh, they have buoy, cold resistance, cooperative, perceptive, uh, versed in their own senses. So they resemble bipedal wolves, standing between 5.5 and 6.5 feet tall, between 175 and 250 pounds. Thick coat of mostly white fur, often with scattered patches of colored brown, gray, or blue, pale blue. Two thirds of them born on the spectrum of death blind or death blind, with several corresponding fur patterns and scents. Uh, the remaining uh, one third are hearing and sighted. So basically, a, there are a lot of them that are born with either being deaf blind or both deaf and blind. Um, 
So that's kind of like an interesting thing to mention about them. They do have other senses, though. That's the Glocka senses. They don't generally walk on four legs except the, during the first years of their life before reaching maturity. Uh, walking four legs is thought to be childish. Um, uh, but the length of their torso compared to their extremities makes four leg movement somewhat awkward and uncomfortable. Uh, they do believe they did once live on four legs. Um, and the tendency to balance on their tiptoes instead of their heels is evidence. So just a little bit about their, their as I said, their, their sun is fading away. Um, vegetation is sparse and consists of shrubs, mosses, bushes, and muted colors. Um, it changes during its relatively warm season, called uh, Valai. When shallow lakes appear across the surface, marshy plants heavy with berries grow quickly, reproduce, and die, uh, leaving their colorful imprints and distinct scents on the planet's surface. Farming, foraging, and hunting... Uh, Valley grows shorter every year, and food supplies are mostly made up of imports from other planets and greenhouses. Um, I'm going there's cities, there's space between, you can dive into it. Uh, circles are an important part of their a group, but it's basically driven them into groups. Strength in numbers and uh, interdependence is key to, to their survival for this species. Um, and because some of them have their hearing and sighting issues, it also helps with that. Everybody basically brings their own perspective, though. Uh, way to search for food, a new scientific discovery. Um, and technological advances allow them to uh, lessen the dangers of their environment, communication more uh, easier. You know, these circles are very important. Um... Traditionally written language that they have is grooved, so it can be read by touch. Um, the uh, grooving is replicated by haptic touch screens nowadays and supplemented with audio descriptions. Uh, their sign language has two variants, a visual and tactile. Um, and they all share scent and touch, though. Um, scent is crucial to nonverbal communications. So scents are incorporated in everything. So, you know, that's the scent they all share. And I said, there's more on them if you want to dive deeper into them. But that's just some of the basics. I, I just want to give you some information on them about their interesting planet, their plight, and what they're trying to uh, fight against. A lot. So this isn't an accurate picture. I'm going to say this now. Why am I using this picture? Well, the uh, Vulcarisu look very much like the common squoxes, which are like a cross between a squirrel and a fox. So I'm giving you a picture of a squoak, because I couldn't find a picture online, because they're from Angels of the Drift number one, page zero. What's Angels of the Drift? It's the comic book series of Starfinder, one of the comic book series. So, their stats are in a comic book. So, I couldn't find a good picture. I don't have the comic book. Enjoy a squoaks. They look a little like it. They aren't... This is the closest thing we can look to them, basically. So from Castroville, there's a lot of sentient life beyond uh, elves. The Insectiformians, the Telepathic Mashtus, the overlooked uh, Vulcarisu. And again, they look like Squoxes. They're about twice as tall uh, than these tiny critters. Their shades of color range from orange-red to deep brown, often with splashes of white fur on the front of their torso. Uh, those in colder climates have, uh, you know, snow-white winter coats, and those in warmer climates typically have larger ears and smaller frames. Their culture emphasizes familiar bonds, communal living, viewing their species as custodians of nature. Uh, they say to live a simple life, but uh, bellies uh, their technology and culture. Uh, Fukushiru and Kitsune view each other as distant relatives each ascending from one of the nine great uh, bright grains that serve the Lady of Foxes, uh, Daikiksu. Uh, but unlike Kitsune, who Daikiksu gifted uh, with her mastery of her shapes, uh, Vulikarisu received the faintest understanding of true speech from their goddess, allowing them to communicate effortlessly with animals of their sentient species. A heretical group uh, of Varakutsu who rejected Daikiksu 
instead serves the demon lord imprisonment. Uh, Shivasa, bound uh, by dark bargain made with Shivasa's Spock's herald, Skew. Oh boy, this is an interesting story. They usually den in city burrows throughout Casterville. Many have left their traditional hunts to take advantage of drift travel, with which uh, Trian revealed to them uh, with etchings on their burrow walls. They've established notable boroughs in many uh, La Shunta cities and Absalon stations uh, to Tembe Park, where Starfinders often recruit them for services as living translators when setting out in the vast. So, yeah, they kind of look like this form here, except bigger, and they they do just tend to live with nature. It's not like they can't completely skew technology. They find like that, uh, what simple lies. They're climbers. Uh, oh, good bonus to dex, penalty strength, big bonus to dex. The guileful tricks, low light vision, my tonic voice, prehensile tail, and they come from uh, Castro. Um, 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 um. That's the little Karishu. All right. So, we have the uh, Witch Weird Alien Archives, the original one. Uh, they're avid, more wanderers, and Invertebrate merchants plying their trade routes on both planets and the planes. So they both travel planets and planar travels. Their forearm, hairless, blue, gray skinned. Uh, eyes glow visibly, increasing brightness as they absorb force energy. They're about seven feet tall, weigh about 300 pounds. Uh, they favor loose flowing robes and distinctive conical hats. And they frequently cover their faces with masks or ornate helmets. Uh, when new to a marker uh, or eager to avoid identification during uh, an important business, um, sometimes they fold one pair of the flexible arms behind their backs and cover their faces. So basically, they might hide the fact who they are if, you know, being trying to be stealthy or basically before people get to know them. Kind of uh, they're acknowledged as the progenitor of the Kathshas uh, and the Shobads of Akaton. They seeded the Akashas and Akatons with intelligent life modeled after themselves remains a mystery. Why they did, who knows. Uh, as does a number of as yet other discovered planets similarly affected. It is undisputed fact, however, that witch weirds are the impetus behind the construction of the Cathos worship of the Dari and their exodus from their home planet uh, to the Pack Worlds. They can be found on nearly any world or plane with civilized trade, preferring dry, warm regions. Uh, but virtually nothing is known of the mysterious homeworld beyond its name, uh, Cyber. The details of their government and society are likewise unknown, other than a widespread belief that mercantile oligarchy of which we are elders directs their rates in the planetary and interplanar trade. Most operate solitary traders, primarily focused on one area of trade, such as weapons or magic items, though most deal in other goods as well. Virtually all of them love haggling, to the point where the process of bargaining sometimes seems more important than them by the eventual deal struck. They often travel with a crew of loyal humanoid mercenaries hired uh, from worlds they've visited in the past. These highlands never speak of their uh, rumenications, uh, purportedly forbidden to do so by uh, punitive clause in their contracts. Uh, they can be encountered throughout the pack worlds, though mostly commonly on Absalom Station, Akaton, and Dari. Um, they do business with members of the Terriot and Interplanetary and Interplanetary Trade Association. Otis is to charisma in intelligence penalty to con. They absorb force. They've got dark vision, force bolt, forearm, and hack. Okay. Let's talk about these folks here. They are the uh, Wayoko. Wayoko? W O I O K O. Heckin' names that they give us here. Heckin' heckin' names. Anyway. They are inhabitants of the ocean planets of uh, Heracon 4 from a Starfinder Adventure Path number 1, page 62. They are from Starfinder number 2, Temple of the Twelve, where they were detailed. So these Starfinder books would be from the original Adventure Path, Dead Suns. So from Dead Suns book 1, their planet was introduced. Dead Suns book 2, they were introduced. They are humanoids of smooth, eel-like skin. They evolved from undersea-dwelling ancestors, but more recently... Split into two subspecies when rising sea levels destroyed uh, their terrestrial civilization. The air breathing flotborn remain above the waves and now uh, reside in vast floating archaeologies divided into dozens of autonomous nations. The deepborn genetically modified themselves to breathe 
uh, water as well as air and returned to their primeval homes deep in the ocean. So basically, ancestors were ocean-going, went onto the surface, water levels rise and destroy their civilization. Uh, where short-lived domains constantly vie for dominance, the two subspecies have little contact with other, other, each remaining in their preferred environment. So your stats depend on if you're deep-born or float-born. Um, so both get bonuses to charisma, but after that, and penalty to constitution, but whether you, you get bonus to strength as a deep-born, then it's bonus to con as a float-born. They're, uh... Uh, the deep born are, of course, amphibious, because uh, they have the aquatic subtype. Both are humanoids, but, you know, uh, the deep born have the aquatic, as I said. Um, float born can hold their breath for a, a good amount of time. Uh, all of them have low light vision. Um, they've got multinational natural swimmer, and, of course, then the two subspecies, which have differences between them. And that's what they got for the Woyoko. Woyoko? 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 Woyoko. Woyoko. We'll take the way. <laughs> I'm pronouncing that. Alright, from Interstellar Species, we of course have uh, the next one here, which is the uh, Rolani. Rolani. Isis. Warlanisis. 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 Osa. Warlanisai. Warlanisai. They're charming intrepid nomads who love to travel years at a time, valuing the journey more than destination. They're outdoorsy, competitive, welcoming to strangers, and they're small structure. They're small humanoids with blue skin. Uh, they appear deceptively delicate. Um, they're striped with strong humanoids with uh, four arms, uh, co horn cones, on either side of their head. I can still speak today. Uh, but let them use their, uh, the horn cones, let them use their psychic powers to stalk prey across Warland. Um, but since this, uh, but use a sense attribute. Modern horn cones allow them to communicate telepathically and wield, uh, luck like, uh, no other species in the galaxy. They also amplify incoming and outgoing psychic energy with painful reverberation. Bonus of strength, charisma, and penalty for wisdom. Limited telepathy, multi-armed, uh, psychic reverb. Their gamble, luck, and movement. All right. Planet pressures of Warlon model them to be strong, lucky, and telepathic. They were originally hunter-gatherers. They evolved into lift able climbers, using their forelimbs to climb through trees while wielding weapons. Um, they're small but wiry frame. Uh, the tallest of them stand about three and a half feet height. Average height, uh, average weight from 22 to 27 pounds. Their frames are very deceptive, though. Um, they can carry burdens much heavier than themselves. Um, of course, the most important evolutionary was they had an environment filled with residual psychic energies. That's why they developed their horn cones, uh, basically to amplify incoming and outgoing psychic symbols. Um, the Ancient Ones used their large, imposing horns to track psychic traces and prey left behind. Um, basically, through the millennia of the pre-Gap era, they shifted to incorporate more luck and cunning into their survival, and with the advent of advanced technology, the reliance on psychic tracking lessens. As a result, their cones have, horn cones have shrunk over generations and become practically residual, uh, but remaining a somewhat painful source of amplification psychic signals. Mental attacks just hit them, uh, and they're very basically vulnerable to psychic abilities. Um, they're still, even with this disadvantage, a pride of their people, uh, of the uh, worst uh, royalist sea, sea, and they paint them in a variety of ways. Uh, they're known for the rare ability to basically uh, gift their luck to allies as well as themselves. Uh, scholars say it comes from their cones, with their limited telepathic gifts, um, and their ability to control luck in adolescence grows as their homes develop. They evolved in Warland, an ocean world covered with island chains. Um, gravity is slightly above average, making it a popular location for top athletes that wish to train on another planet. Um, uh, but uh, due to their toxic te tectonic Plate movement is geographically active. It's known for its earthquakes, volcanoes, steam geysers, soaring mountain ranges, 
Um, and it has an environmental memory, a unique combination of minerals and innate psychic energy that retrains faint traces and memories of people and creatures that travel. So ghost sightings are common here. Um, yeah. The primary spaceport is located in the largest, oldest, many islands, uh, Narasai, as the main technological hub. Um, you can look more about that. Um, they have an easygoing and trusting society because they have good fortune. Uh, luck is central to a society of them, um, and it cr credits most of every event in their lives. Good outcomes, no matter how hard that they are worked for or how much one prepared for them, are evidence of one's luck. Indeed, most view luck as a seed that needs hard work and the right conditions to grow properly. So it's sort of like, if you set everything up right, you know, it's you're going to get that best, uh, your, your luck will make sure you get that best uh, outcome. Uh, even in times of disaster and tragedy, it can be looked at later as blessings in disguise for the growth and changes they brought. Because luck needs help, uh, they value ach achievement and skill. So it's like, we are lucky. We can, can have that good outcome, but we need a little bit of stuff in its way. And they take great pleasure in artisan crafting, clever solutions, and improvising, uh, improving their communities. They prefer telepathic communication to psychic or to spoken language because of their psychic hypersensitivity. Uh, telepathic communication is innate and practical. Um, it allows a boat crew to communicate in a storm, two hunters to stealthy sneak up and play, and friends to chat while dancing in a loud night crow. Uh, spoken words for formal occasions for song or other entertainment. They do get well with most other cultures, adapting local customs and traveling and bringing back their favorite practices to warlord. They do have little patience for any customs they find self-destructive. Destroying an ecosystem for short-term benefits uh, largely baffles them. Uh, they tend to com uh, they also tend to completely dismiss other species' attempts to artificially boost luck as talismans and other superstitions. Luck is inherent. Uh, you can look more into your culture and the Vault of Burlath and all that kind of stuff if you want to read up on it. Interstellar Species Book, if you want to suggest stuff, they do have it up on the Archives of Venice. Two. One is one. Alright, we got two more to speak about today, and I'm going to try to pronounce these guys pretty well. I'm not good at pronouncing anything, so they... Uh, Rick Creechy, Rick Creechy, from Alien Archive. Spindly and deliberate, they are chitness filter feeders who bear much resemblance to mollusks as they do air-breathing humanoids. Uh, their lower limbs are robust, capable of clinging to uh, jagged surfaces for extended periods, while their forelimbs bear dozens of long, fibrous whiskers uh, that fan out uh, like a bailing to catch passing food particles. These four limbs also bear a set of three grasping claws, which they use to manipulate objects, weapons, and tools. Mm. Uh, they're natives of Achikos, a lonely, watery planet with a fairly eccentric orbit around a orange, a main sequence star. Much of their existence, uh, through much of its existence, Achikos was covered in uh, uh, ice miles thick, melting only, a only partially every three years when the planet drew close to the sun. Fairly simple life developed in these concealed oceans, feeding upon nutrients uh, surging from deep sea vents. Only a modest range of more complex life evolved in these limitless depths, and among these were the uh, rich creatures, soft body organisms who developed rigid exos exoskeletons allowed them to wander and feed during the warming cycle. During the cooling cycle, they molded their shells and retreated to the coral like uh, constructions to conserve energy and socialize in their wintering colony. As best as modern scholars can tell, they kind of, their kind involves self-awareness and higher thought process as a direct extension of this community to live in. Uh, their species developed only rudimentary technologies in the absence of fire and metallurgy. Their cultural love of history, mathematics, and philosophy made them highly educated people. For the past 100,000 years, uh, their sun has grown hotter, melting more and more of the planet's ice. Several centuries before the gap, Akos thaws uh, enough to expose its immense ocean, revealing the cosmos to the, for them for the first time. They'd already developed complex astronomical theories by the time packed world explorers arrived 50 years ago. And although the Rick Creechies uh, still only had simple tools, they had the academic, academic aptitude to quickly understand and adapt to visitors' technologies. While still fairly uncommon beyond their homeworld, traveling Rick Creechies scholars and engineers are renowned for creating wonders of architecture and adapting old technologies in more ways. Among their most popular developments was a swath of pharmaceuticals 
extensive biotech solutions that help them adapt to life in dry environments. Most importantly, these include a series of hormonal enhancements to allow them to maintain their shell year-round. And a biotech vocal enhancer allows the creature to project its voice and enumerate at near-human levels, uh, without which a witchery simple draw and throat mangle a range of constant and barely project uh, above a whisper in the air. Much of their language is conveyed through arm movements and chirps, an entire syntactic structure is expressed solely through vibrations felt over a short distance of water. These grammatical constitutions are reserved primarily for uh, terms of endearment, trust, and understanding. As a result, uh, they emit a near inaudible buzz around dear friends and find communication over comms units stressingly sterile. Uh, temperature fluctuation remains the bane of most of them uh, because of their adaptations to seasonal stimuli. They become noticeable toped in cold we weather, and heat can spur practical manic bouts of energy. Those who can afford to wear suits with environmental controls to maintain body temperature and prevent any mood swings that otherwise result. Most of their travelers delight in clothing and crowded rooms, finding both to be susceptible replacements for the colonies they left behind. So they're an interesting group that uh, evolved in an interesting place. Bonus to con ink, kind of decks. They're amphibious, cooperative, dark vision, sheltering. Uh, snag, and their moot. I like that. They're very neat. And finally, we have, which I don't have a Starfinder image of, so I had to go for a Pathfinder image of here. We have, of course, the, uh, uh, Zulgath. Um, so. Don't know about the Zulgath. Pathfinder. Uh, another, they're uh, commonly known as troglodytes. So if you know about them more from Dungeons and Dragons, troglodytes. They are from Ports of Call, as the source that talks about them. Uh, uh, their pheromone cloud ability does not affect themselves, as a note, and is negated by environmental protections as an inhaled hazard. So, uh, and you're if you're a place that has things to protect against environmental hazards, yeah. They are reptilian humanoids who originated on Glarian. Bonus to strength, con, penalty uh, to charisma. They've got ancestral knowledge, a pheromone cloud, and their senses. They're about 5 feet tall, about 150 pounds. Females tend to be larger and heavier. They give birth to live young in clutches of one or two. They have glands inside of their neck that produce pheromones that though often offensive to the senses of other species, are vital to their language and communications. Uh, they evolve in lightless con conditions, so they have shades of white or gray. Communities uh, that migrate to live above ground are known to develop more vibrant colors over generations. They're strong and hardy, but because their language involves complex pheromones as well as spoken words, non zuglas can find them reticent or off-putting and are unable to discern the full meaning of what they say. Contrary to some prejudices, they don't... Uh, they don't always have an offensive odor, but actually have acute control over this aspect of physiology, and will just uh, frequently adjust the way they communicate with one another so not to offend their neighbors. Uh, drow, and being labor for them, is why they spread throughout much of the galaxy, but they've since established their own communities. Uh, they have one of the largest recorded histories uh, for an intelligent species, but after millennia of uh, intentional cultural erasure, many of the history has been lost. What remains is passed down through oral... Uh, Ulfurcation, storytelling that doesn't exist in written form. Due to the frequent resources scarcity throughout their history, their society is quick to uh, disregard those deemed weak, which can come across as callous to other species. They tend to value individual strength and are quickly uh, to propose contests of prowess, not necessarily physical, as a means of, uh, to solve conflicts. Uh, their, their collectives tend towards neutrality, though individuals are the gambits of alignments. Um, yeah, that's it. That's just they, they exist in the Starfinder world too. Just to note that. And that's it. We've we finished up all the Starfinder species. Our guide that I was doing over here. As I said, more might show up as more books come out. If second edition comes out, we might revisit some of these, get more information about the worlds and things like that. So I'd always recommend checking out a lot of the new stuff. Archives and Death is a great way. But I hope. Regardless if you're playing Pathfinder or Starfinder 1st Edition, or you do try to check out 2nd Edition, this gives you a vast idea of the amazing and wonderful species that are out there. That's the thing about Starfinder I love. 
beyond things like your Star Wars and Star Trek, they tend to have very humanoid species, occasionally ones that are outside of it. Starfinder embraces the weird, unusual, the things that are out there that are unique and interesting, that so many species can appear in so many physical forms, and that intelligence can come because of so many little things out there. And it gives you this sense that the universe is large. There are plenty of humanoid things, but there's plenty of things that are only vaguely humanoid, or their own thing. So many creatures out there in their own unique forms and body shapes that, you know, show how things can be so different from places that have single genders to multiple genders, societies that are highly interconnected, some that are individualistic. The unique ways that Starfinder shows its alien species is so fascinating. I love seeing it. And I hope you've enjoyed this travels through it. I'll probably do some more Starfinder things in the future. You know, expect more videos at some point in time. But for now, I think we're done. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I, I do want to see and talk more about this stuff when I come up with a great idea for it. And maybe if you want to learn more about some of these species, or if there's more species to talk about in different books and stuff like that, and more things get introduced, maybe I'll revisit it in the future. But until that time, I hope all of you out there have enjoyed learning about all these over these bunch of episodes. I think we ended up at uh, like eight episodes of these going over the different species. It's a lot of them. And, you know, maybe it's inspired you for a couple of characters. But until the next time, um, I hope you remember to check out all my stuff. Remember, this is streamed live on Twitch and put up on YouTube. Give all that support there, as I said earlier. I do have social media. Discord, Twitter.com. Check those out. Uh, it's usually the cat pics and schedule updates and stuff like that. And random thought patterns. If you're looking for more tabletop related stuff, of course, you can go check out the YouTube channel. All my stuff is archived up there, but if you want to catch it live, um, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays. Tuesdays, Thursdays, usually between 1 and 2 we get started. Uh, sometimes later, sometimes uh, earlier, depending on life schedule. And of course, uh, Tuesdays is our day we do things like Starfinder and stuff. Thursdays is usually Pathfinder. Saturdays is around 11 o'clock, pretty exactly because of schedule. That's our World of Darkness day. I do have a live play. Uh, the Crimson Queen is the current one as of streaming this one. Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Tabletop discussion show discussing tabletop Saturdays at 6 p.m. Uh, the Crimson Queen is Pathfinder first edition. You want to check that out. Really fun game. Really fun to have people check that one out too. I do some gaming streams Monday, Thursdays, Fridays if you want to see those. Anyway, yeah. And that's it. So, all of you out there, keep your eyes to the space. Maybe get into your spaceship. Hit the drift. And until the next time we talk about Starfinder, Pathfinder, something else, I bid all of you out there a wonderful and heartfelt farewell.